Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. God is so beautiful. Uh, He really is weaving things together tonight uh, like I couldn't have imagined. Uh, The very things Pastor Charles was talking about are the very things I'm going to talk about. And then is it Aaron? Was it Aaron? Aaron, Sharing his message just so beautifully aligns the worship. And so I just know that God's ready to do some business tonight. It's not a mistake that he talks to four different people about the same thing for one night. So know that you are here for such a time as this, that God has something for you. He wants to speak to you because he loves you. And I'm here to declare that fear will not have a hold on any of our lives when we leave this building tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time together. God, I thank you, God, what you have already weaved together. Lord, I thank you that you have a divine purpose for the people in this room tonight and those that are watching online. God, I thank you what you have prepared for these amazing people in this place. God, move through me. Speak through me. God, if we need to scratch everything I planned, please do it, Lord. Just let me speak what they need to hear tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Thank you so much, you guys. All right. We feeling good? Who's all going to marriage retreat? Show me, show me, show me. Okay, come say hi. We got to hang out. Come say hi, and it's not too late. I say be spontaneous. Some of the best memories are made when you're spontaneous. Just be crazy. Just register and come and see what happens. (laughs) Pastor Leanne was sharing this morning. She's like, I'm not joking. My message alone is worth the registration fee. (laughs) So if she's going to say something like that, you know it is going to be good. Well, I'm just going to start right off in my message. I'm going to be reading uh, quite a bit from the Old Testament tonight, but I'm going to start with Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. You shall not bow down to any idols or serve them. And I think if I asked the question tonight, what we all kind of thought of what idols were, I think we would get a whole different like slew of answers. I mean, I think a lot of us know that idols just aren't like carved images and and Buddhas and things that we bow down to in worship. Idols can be so much more than that. You know, the Bible talks about in Philippians 3.19 that idols can be associated with the heart, pride, self-centeredness, greed, gluttony. In Matthew 6.24, it talks about how we can make our possessions and our wealth an idol. So idols are things, anything that we really treasure more than God, and anything that maybe drives our thoughts and our actions can become our idol if we're not careful. And I think even Webster's Dictionary gets it pretty right here when good old Webster tells us that the worship of idols or the worship of idols is an excessive devotion to or reverence for some person or some thing. So if we really paused and looked and evaluated our lives, I bet we could actually, we'd be a little bit surprised about how many things we might be able to consider idols that we've made in our lives. I mean, money. Money can be a huge idol for people. And I think you kind of might know as a believer, if money has become an idol, if you look at your bank account, you can really determine what you worship and what you bow down to and what you serve. I think we can make our bodies idle when you have so much of this devotion it talks about to one thing. You spend so much time devoted to your figure and your body and your fitness that you aren't as devoted or you don't spend any devotion and time with the Lord. I think our relationships can become idols, especially those new ones, those, those where all the butterflies are happening and like you're obsessed and all of your time goes into this new relationship, but then your relationship with God starts to grow a little distant. I think for a lot of women, uh, and maybe even men, we can make our homes our idols. How many of us have to have our homes perfect before anyone can come over? 
Do our homes have to look like a Pottery Barn magazine or Magnolia before we entertain people of God in our homes? We can make our homes our idol. We can make our children our idols. Oh my goodness, we can make our children, our, we prioritize them over our spouse, over God, over our own schedule. Everything that we do, we prioritize our kids and we bow to every request to make them happy. And I think we can be passionate about all these things. I don't think that's wrong at all to be passionate about prospering, pr- passionate about our physical health, passionate about all these things. However, if we have an excessive devotion to any of these things, and it takes up the majority of our time, of our thought life, of our actions, that will end in- in- eventually diminish our ability to fully worship God and serve God if those things are taking all of our devotion and all of our time. Amen? Amen. So feel free uh, to put up my uh, title screen tonight. Are you ready? Okay. I have to remember face on this side. Yes. Face on this side, face on this side. Okay. Oh, which is why I wore tennis shoes. <laughs> because I don't, I'm going to be moving around, and I couldn't be bothered with clicking around with heels as I share. So there's a reason I'm so casual tonight. But as I was reading these, this scripture in the Bible about idols, like not worshiping other gods or serving other gods or bowing down and worshiping things, it was amazing. God gave me, I'm sitting in the, my backyard watching the sun ever so slightly pierce the clouds and I'm reading about idols. And it was like the Holy Spirit just gave me a download, this vision. And what I saw was something similar to this. So thank you, Pastor Morgan, for making that happen. But as I was reading this, I, I realized, and God, God showed me on one side was faith, and then on the other side was fear. And these represented idols, the true God that we're meant to worship, faith, and then the false God of fear. And I felt the Lord say this to me, how many times have you bowed down and worshiped and obeyed the voice of fear instead of the voice of faith? And as I started to pray on this, it was like I saw a vision of hundreds of people, including myself, vacillating between the two idols. And depending on what subject that person was thinking about, decided on where they would bow their knee. And I would see people contemplating, should I take this job? This is a big step. It's going to take more time, more commitment. And I saw people and they would bow down and they would believe in faith that God was going to be able to provide the ability for them to take on more responsibility and handle this promotion. And then I saw people vacillating about what they should be doing with their finances, what the Lord has asked them to do, where they should sow their money. And I saw people vacillating because they knew the truth, but then they went over and then they kept doing this and then they would eventually bow down and they would serve fear and they would listen to the voice of fear. And it was like every different decision I could like see inside people's minds what they were deciding and they would vacillate and eventually they would choose one or the other. But sadly in this vision, I saw more people, more believers choosing fear and bowing down to fear and listening and worshiping the voice of fear over worshiping the voice of God and faith. As believers... We're called believers because we're supposed to believe. (laughs) And we're supposed to believe in faith. But faith just can't stay faith and believing. Our faith has to have works because the Bible says without without faith, we we have, what does the Bible say? The Bible says without works, faith is dead, which says that in James 2, 26. And without faith, it's impossible to please God in Hebrews 11, 16. So as believers, we are called in an ideal world if we truly believed God, trusted God, his promises, and all the good things he has for us, we would be over here constantly, no matter what he asks, no matter how hard it seems or how difficult it could be, we would be over here bowing our knee to his voice in faith. But instead, we let the world speak to us and we let fear creep in and we find so many Christians over here missing out on everything that faith could have brought them. I've done this in my own life and I regret it every time. In what areas of our life have we made fear our God? In what areas of our life have we made fear our God? When we think back on past decisions that we made, did we bow our knee to the voice of fear or do we bow our knee to God in faith and see his blessings and his promises come to pass in our lives. 
have we bowed our knee to fear? And this is what it can look like in life. When it, let, let's say God asks you to, to end a relationship. In, in your heart of hearts, you know it's unhealthy. You know it's not God's best for you. But you stand in the middle of believing God where he says, you need to let go of this relationship. I have more for you. I have better for you. This is not what I have planned for you. This is not my best. Will you trust me and let go of this relationship? And then you're in the middle and you can kind of hear what God's voice is saying. You're like, but I've been in this relationship for three years. I don't want to start over. And what if I end the relationship and then, and then I have to be single for five more years waiting for God's best? And what if I end the relationship and I end up single forever? And we, and we vacillate between God's voice and fear's voice. But how many of us bow our knee to the voice of fear? And when we bow our knee to the voice of fear, when God is asking you to give up something for your good, you miss out on everything he had planned for you over there. I dated someone for almost five years. We were about to get engaged. We were going to get married. And I was in this very place vacillating going, oh my gosh, five years? I don't want to start over. I don't want to give up five years. But God was telling me very clearly that while this person was a good person, this was not the relationship that I have for you. I was scared. I had no idea what it would look like to give up a five-year relationship. But I thank God that in my vacillating between the two, I chose God and I bowed my knee to faith because if I didn't, I would never be married to Pastor Johnny freaking Heinrichs, Charles. <laughs> even want to know. I don't even want to know if I would have bowed my knee to fear in that moment and walked down that aisle. I wouldn't even have known what I would have been missing out on. But what would my life have been? What about when God asks you to share the gospel with someone? We're in the middle, okay? I hear your voice. Lord, I know they need Jesus. It's pretty clear they need Jesus. <laughs> and I know that I'm a minister of reconciliation, the Bible says. And I know their eternity is at stake. But what if they freak out? What if they get angry at me? What if they yell at me? What if I don't know what to say and I sound like a fool? And we're in this place. And then we just, we start listening to the voice of fear like, making this scenario up in our head that most likely is never going to happen. True. But we bow our knee to fear and just go, oh, maybe I'll just wait till next Christmas and I'll invite him to twist it. <laughs> but God is asking you to share the gospel with them now because they need the gospel now, not a year from now. You may lose a little bit of status quo if they think you're a believer. They may get a little bit annoyed with you. But you know what? What they can lose is a whole lot greater than what you could lose if you, sh if you share the gospel with them, if you don't share the gospel with them. I'm just trying to make us aware of the dialogue that we have inside our head when God is asking us to believe in faith and trust him and obey. But how many times we end up bowing our knee to fear in everyday life, little things. What about when God says, and I'm going to get to vision builders yet. What about God? Every, every week we sit in this place and you hear what the Bible says about bringing your tithe, your 10%. Every week, every Wednesday, every Sunday you hear that the 10% belongs to the Lord. And if you don't bring it, you're robbing it from God. And when you rob it from God, the Bible says that you are cursed with a curse. And you, you would rather live on 90% blessed by God under an open heaven with the multiplication factor than 90 or 100% curse. Where the Bible says you work so hard and it's like you put money with, with that. Has, you have holes in your pocket and it falls to the ground and you're striving, trying to get ahead, but the money just goes through because you're being disobedient to the Lord. We hear all these things. We hear when we give, it will be given to you, breast down, shake and get and run over. When we give, we sow our seed, the, the windows of heaven open over our life and pour out so much blessing. There's no, no, we don't have to receive it. We hear all these things, faith, faith, faith. But then when you actually have to act it out and, and write that check of 10%, we come over here and go, I don't even know how I can live on a hundred. I, I just, you know, I, I, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. So you're going to listen to everyone else's stories about they have their breakthrough week after week. You're going to hear how they stepped out on water and saw a miracle, but you always stay in the boat and you never see what they see in your lives. Wow. 
And many of us, God's been speaking to us about fish, finishing our vision builders, the commitment that we made to the Lord before the end of this, of this year in June. And we're like, and, we, and we, we keep saying things like this, which is starting to bother me. Let's believe you can finish your pledge. That's great. We have faith. Let's believe God. What are we believing for? That he's going to give us a harvest so that we can sow? Because the Bible says when you sow, the harvest will come. So if, if we just keep saying we're believing, but never put actions to our faith in believing, we will never see the harvest. Because that's opposite the kingdom. So I say we f- have faith. We don't understand how God's going to do it, how next one's going to happen or this or that. But do you not understand the blessing that comes when you stretch and you're obedient to him? You are missing out on the blessing. What about stepping out to buy a home? San Diego's interesting. We all know that. You really feel like it's time to stop renting and, and to get a home. Oh, but my gosh, you start looking on Redfin and Zillow and oh, the prices, what you can get for a million dollars. Oh my gosh. But you know, God's like, come on now. It's time to take territory. You're taking ter- territory in the kingdom. You're bringing your tithe. You're bringing your vision builders. And God says, when you build his house, he will build your house he will build your house. He's talking to you. He's speaking to you about getting into a home. But then you start going, oh, but the market, like what's the market going to do? Oh, the interest rates. What if everything tanks with all this political stuff going on? What if the bank shut down? <laughs> but God said, it's your time. Right, right, right. So, so if God says it's your time, it's your time to trust him and obey in faith and believe and see that he is faithful to you, that he can do a miracle for you just like he's done for other people. But so many of us, year after year, waiting for the market to be perfect, waiting for the interest rates to be perfect, waiting for San Diego to all of a sudden look like Oregon prices. <laughs> but God told you to do it. So So if God told you to do it, what are you missing out on by sitting here? You are missing out. If God asked you to step out in faith and obey, do you not think he has the most epic plan for your life? Oh my gosh, he totally does. Oh my gosh, he's not like, yeah, buy a home and then I'm going to screw you. Oh my gosh. uh. Oh, it's funny, but like, but we make decisions like that. It's crazy. What are the thoughts that run through your head when God asks you to step out and start a business? He's asking you. You're here. Where are you going to lie? Where are you going to bow? If he's asked you to do it, you know he's going to make a way. What, is it, what does it look like in your head? What are the conversations that you have with yourself when you have a friend starting to make some bad decisions? Oh, that looked a little flirty when you were talking to that guy over there. You're married. Oh, that's a little, noticing you're just having a little too much wine every time we're together. You see these things. Faith says, let's save your friend from walking off a cliff and have the conversation. But then fear says, oh my gosh, what if they get mad? What if I lose the friendship? What, what if, what if we, we're not going to be friends anymore and I'm going and, and to lose her? Where, where would we bow? Because it's a reality. I'm not saying none of these things. That could be a reality. But would you rather your friend walk off a cliff and destroy their life or, or, or have the opportunity for maybe to potentially prevent destruction and their marriage falling apart. Like what are the thoughts that go through our head? And we don't have the conversations that we need to have because we're, we're in fear of what might happen when God's saying, have the conversation and let, let me, I'll show you what I will do in their lives. We cannot bow our knee to fear. I was just thinking about even Abraham. Well, he was a man of faith and he was known for righteousness and all these things. He had a little blip in his story. 
Because you know how long he waited for his promised son, the promised son, which, which eventually ended up being Isaac. But somewhere along the line, he had a, a moment where he's like, oh my gosh, Lord, are you really going to fulfill the promise that you told me? I mean, you told me that I was going to have a son, the promised son. And, and now it's been decades and here I am still not a father. And so at, or Abraham's over here going, oh, I know what God said, and I do believe him, but now a lot of time has passed. Now I'm a little bit worried. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to bow my knee to fear over here, and, and I'm going to take my wife's maidservant as a wife, and I'm going to bear a son. And, and, and then he, he bears Ishmael. Ishmael. He's not the promised son. He bores Ishmael. Guess what happens with Ishmael's lineage? Do you know Ishmael's lineages are the same people that are warring against Israel to this day? He bowed, you, you never know what the consequences will be when you bow your knee to fear. Every time you bow your knee to fear, you are in the enemy's territory and it will never go well because you are bowing your knee. You're saying, I surrender to the enemy. What do you think is gonna happen? I don't need for a second doubted that God was being truthful to them, like that God was like holding out on them because he believed the, the enemy, the serpent. And they're like, oh, well, God, no, but God said, I believe him, I trust him, but God said. Then the enemy's like, oh, did God really say? If you eat this, da, 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 he's holding out on you. So they're like, well, I want, I want to be like God. He must be holding out on me. They bow their knee, they eat the apple, sin and death enter the world, ruining all of our lives. <laughs> And then God had to send his one and only son, his one and only son whom he loved to die on the cross, the most brutal death of all time, to save us from our sin nature that happened because Adam and Eve gave in to a moment of fear where they thought God was holding out on them. You are in the enemy's territory when you bow your knee to fear every single time. Let's just clap. That's right? I feel like we need to like break the tension. I'm very intense about this. Oh. <laughs> I gotta get moving. All right. What shall I skip? But then you have people like Esther who literally is faced with death. She goes before the king unannounced to speak up to save her people. And, and, and when someone does that, it means death. But she, knowing that she could be killed in a moment, knew that she had to, she had to believe in faith that God was with her to save God's people. So literally putting her own life on the line, thinking it would gonna end in death, she didn't give in to this. She trusted God, and because she went in, she saved the entire Jewish people. When we choose this, we are in God's territory, and God will always be faithful to his promise, and he will always bring you through in victory. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get through this uh, really, really quickly, but I think, so it's like, we do this all the time. I just want us to start thinking about what we think about yeah. when we're faced with decisions. Yeah. And every time, give each other permission. If I'm facing something, am I giving in to fear? Am I bowing my knee to, to the enemy's voice where I'm gonna miss out on everything that that could bring me? Or am I listening to God, even though I don't know how it's gonna happen, who's gonna come alongside or anything, but if he's asked you to do it, he's gonna provide a way. Yeah but it doesn't tell you the details before you start going. Wouldn't that be nice? But I was reminded how quickly believers can go from faith to fear. How quick it can happen. Because we know all of this, yet so often we bow over here. But we know it, but we bow over here. And I was just reading through the story of the Israelites, and I'm going to have to paraphrase a lot. The Israelites, we know, were, were 
slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God saves them, you know, putting the 10 plagues on, on Pharaoh and the land, and, and they come out, and they've, they've been promised. That, did, you, did you know that God promised the Israelites the promised land for 585 years before they stood in front of it? For 585 years, God said, I am giving you this land. This land is yours. This land is my land. This land is your land. Like, no, he was 585 years. This is it. Can't wait for you to get there. All the Israelites are standing in front of it after 585 years of waiting. So then so the Bible says that uh, they're standing in front of it, the land that God has given to them, past tense, given, it's already done. And so they said, there, let's put together uh, a group of 12 spies, one man from every tribe. And it says, so Caleb and Joshua, Caleb and Joshua, yes, yes, uh, were two of the 12 spies. The other 10 spies were leaders in tribes, which that kind of brings me to another point I'm going to get to in a minute. They were leaders of those tribes. So they were the most influential voice in those tribes. So they chose the highest leader with the most influence from every tribe to go in to spy the land for 40 days. When they spy the land out for, for 40 days, they come back with a report. And it said in Numbers 13, 25 through 29, it says, and they returned from spying out the land after 40, 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness at Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They told him and said, we went to the land where you sent it. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit. They brought back a a grapevine that two men had to carry because the grapes were so huge. And they're like, they came back, you're like, oh my gosh, it's everything you said and more. All right. But then, they, so, so they just said, oh my gosh, it's everything you said and more. It truly flows with milk and honey and then it's fruit. And then it says, and then it says, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. This is one conversation. It's so amazing, food of the land, but the, the giants and the people. And then Caleb's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, guys. It says Caleb quieted the people before Moses said, no, let us go up. At once and take possession. We are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with them, the other 10 spies that were leaders of the tribes, says we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report, a fearful report. And the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours it devours us, its inhabitants, and all the people who we saw are of great stature. There were, we saw giants, guys. And we're like grasshoppers in our sight. And so are we in their sight. And then Numbers 14 tells us that the people believed the negative, fearful report of the 10 spies. And their consequence was that entire generation, because they would not believe God, because they didn't have faith and believe God, they physically were unable to actually go up and take the land because they refused to move. It wasn't that God couldn't do it. He had already actually done it in the spirit for them. But because they had no faith and they didn't trust God for his promises and to come through and be faithful, God could not take them up. So that entire generation died out in the wilderness, wandering, and, and they never saw the promise that had been promised to them because they gave in to the voice of fear. Can, so think about this. This is just a, a one conversation, like a fifth of this with me with you. And all excited, then all of a sudden, two sentences, you guys, two sentences shifted an entire congregation with millions of people to move from faith, knowing that God had promised them that, over to fear. And they all died out in the wilderness. It took two sentences for fear to creep in. And Caleb noticed it. He's like, oh my gosh, guys, no, 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 no. He could sense it. It was like, everyone's excited, full of faith. And then all of a sudden, you know, two sentences of fear and everyone's like, oh no, mm, we can't go in. How quickly fear can enter our hearts that determine where we bow, which will determine our destiny. It is so important to listen to the right voices in the moments where you're vacillating between two things. 
Unfortunately, these were 10 leaders, the most influential of their tribes. And these leaders did not lead in faith. They were God's people. So it's really important who we go to when we're vacillating and we need encouragement to, to bow our knee to faith. Not just to a believer, but do they have wisdom? Do they have faith? Those are the kind of people you need to talk to when you're making decisions where you're vacillating between the two. The next interesting thing I, I find with this story is obviously they said the descendants of Anak. And they were giants. They were huge. And immediately they started talking about how big they are. They even described their size, how, how big they are. And we were like grasshoppers then, which wasn't even true. It wasn't even true. They were exaggerating the fear. They made the fear so huge. They, they amplified the bigness of the problem, fear, instead of amplifying faith, where God already told them that they were going to conquer everyone in the land. So they focused on the problem, the worry, the concern, instead of what God's promise had, had been told to them. So we have to be so careful when we're vacillating that we are not amplifying the problem, that we are amplifying the power of God and his promises and his faithfulness of what he said he would do in our lives. Now let's at the Amalekites. They were afraid of the Amalekites. And there's a little bit of a reason why they were afraid of the Amalekites. Like I, I can imagine when they heard the voice that the Amalekites were in their land, they're like, ooh, they shuddered. Because they had a history with the Amalekites. Because the Bible talks about, and they retell this story in Deuteronomy, it says in Deuteronomy 7, 7, or sorry, 25, 17 through 19, they're recounting this story. It says, this is when the Israelites, um, they were, the, the Amalekites were like basically really brutal to the Israelites when they, they left Egypt. It says, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt? When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind, which is usually the women and children. They had no fear of God. And the scripture goes on to say, when the Lord your God gives you the rest from all your enemies around you in the land he is giving you as a promise, as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget it. They're remembering this battle that was so painful. This is the same battle where Moses went to the top of the hill with the staff of God in his hand. This is the same battle where Moses was up there and he was lifting that staff to the Lord. And the Bible says whenever he lifted his staff to the Lord, that the Israelites were prevailing. But when he grew weak and weary and started to drop the staff, then, then the Amalekites started to win in battle. And so Aaron and Hur went up and they put a stone under him so he could sit. And they held his hand upon either side until the sun went down. And eventually they had victory in that battle. But that battle did not come without pain. It did not come without loss and heartache. So you can imagine when they said the Amalekites were in the land, they immediately went back to where they lost their children and they lost their wives and their fathers and their uncles and their brothers. And so because, and we can all sympathize the pain that that would bring up, that it would trigger in you. But while we sympathize, unless we actually heal from past wounds, and pain and disappointment. We will never lay hold of the promises that God has for us because we'll be ruled by fear. I think it was Lance Waller that said, what you bow your knee to at the bottom will eventually rule you at the top. We have to heal from the pain of our past and we cannot allow a disappointment or a tragedy that grieved the heart of God to lower our expectations of what his promises are for us. His promises are true. They will never change. But if we lower our expectations of what God can do for us because of a past experience that brought fear, again, how are we ever gonna lay hold of this? I remember, I mean, when you think about how often this happens, women, we have... You know, I was expecting our first baby, keeping it a secret from everyone. We were so fun to like keep it a secret. 11 weeks pregnant, out of nowhere, just a brutal miscarriage. And I remember knowing what the promises of God were, 
Like I, I knew we were gonna have a family. I knew that that is what we were meant to do. We're, we're called to be fruitful. Blessed is the fruit of your womb, the Bible says. But because I'd only known loss in that situation, I was so afraid to get pregnant again. Because even though I knew his promises, all I felt in reality was loss. And I remember making the decision, even finding out when we were pregnant again, oh, I found myself over here so much, caused so much anxiety. And I would continually have to remind myself of God's faithfulness and of his goodness and the promises that he made towards us. So you can really see how past experience, if we don't heal from it, can keep us from believing and going again. We cannot allow the painful experiences from our past to ruin our future. And the last thing I think that can keep us knowing what we know and we know we need to be over here, but we find ourselves over here. So the Israelites were afraid of the giants ahead of them, the mountains in their way. They were afraid of the Amalekites because of past trauma that had gone unhealed. But then they found themselves afraid of the future. Because then they go on to say, they start talking about the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites. And actually from like basically the beginning of time, God warned the Israelites about these people. Because he said, they serve other gods. You're not to intermarry with them. You're not to have a relationship with them because they will bring your destruction because you will eventually intermarry with them and their gods will become your gods and great destruction will happen. And we see that play out later in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. But all of these people groups represented people they would have to overthrow to possess the promised land. Here's the thing, the promise is theirs, past tense. I had given it to you. It's yours. And the Bible says he's going to drive out the inhabitants and they're going to possess the land. Like, so all of a sudden we think, oh, well, it's a promise. It's going to be super easy. But then when some challenge or some, we got to activate or we got to fight or battle to make sure the, the promise is going to come to pass, which it will, but there's a part we have to play. Whoever said it was going to be easy, no one. If they have, they're lying. Did you know they had to face the fear of their future coming against all these people groups? There were 31 kings they had to overthrow to fully possess, possess the promised land. But you're saying, yeah, so there's gonna be 31 battles, but God said you're gonna have the victory. God said it's yours, like they're gonna be driven out. Like God already told them the end of the story. But because they feared the battles ahead, and they didn't want it to be hard, they wanted it to be easy. They bowed their knee to fear and never entered their promise. We're not just afraid of our past, sometimes we could be afraid of the future. But if we know that God is with us, when we know that he's promised us what he's promised us, and we know that he's faithful to his word, and he will not fail you. All of his promises are yes and amen, the Bible says. Why are we still over here? <laughs> Myself included. <sighs> like what's stopping us? Like what are we afraid of? We cannot stay in the enemy territory and think we're gonna lay hold of the promise. And every lie in hell that comes against you to make you think you're safer over here is a lie from the pit of hell. Everything that you want in your life is over here. It's gonna be hard. It might be scary. You might have to overcome some past expectations of hurt and things that could happen. You might have to battle a little bit, but the promise is true for you. As believers, we have to stop bowing our knee to fear and start bowing our knee and worshiping God in faith, 
trusting Him, obeying Him, believing that His Word is true. And when He asks you to do something, like the gentleman in the tithe, he's like, wow, I'm, I'm believing to pay my wedding, but God's asking me to give a big offering. Does it make sense? We're over here. God asked you to obey, which is to have faith and trust Him and act. But I'm like, oh my gosh, I have my wedding. Oh, wow, well, my ha. But guess what? He obeyed God, and then he sowed, and then the harvest, and then the breakthrough. Oh my gosh, I just want this for all of us so bad. And I hope that came across in my aggressiveness. Like, I want us to live in this in every single area of our life. His promises are for you. He loves you so much. Let this be a year we are known to bow to faith and faith alone. Come on, let me pray for you. Lift your hands to heaven. Oh. Thank you, Lord. God, help us. God, help us listen to your voice. Lord, help us to obey your voice, even when it seems hard and we're afraid. God, that we would obey your voice in the midst of fear, because we will win every time. God, I pray you would put people in their path where they could share, where they're vacillating between, God, and you would place people in their life with wisdom and with faith to encourage them on, to move forward when they don't even know what their next step looks like. But God, we know the next step is gonna lead to the next step that leads to the breakthrough and the fulfillment of the promise in their lives. God, fill everyone afresh tonight with a spirit of faith. I bind and I crush the spirit of fear in people's lives right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I come against you, spirit of fear, with the authority that Jesus Christ has given me. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in me and lives in them. And I declare with that authority and that power, the enemy's voice is silenced in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for the days ahead. God, I thank you the, the what's going to happen when we bow our knee to faith and we trust you, God. God, that our lives would be marked by miracles. God, and as I said, Lord, I pray that every single person that gets to always hear about others walking on water and seeing a miracle, that this would be the year they would get out of the boat and walk on water. God, they would see the miraculous in their lives. God, they would have their own testimonies of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your supernatural working power. God, I thank you that you are with them. You go before them. You will never leave them or forsake them. God, and I thank you that your promises are yes and amen for every believer in this room. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's give God a shout of praise. We are people of faith. We are people of faith. And we will see the miraculous in our lives. Oh my gosh, I love you guys, like a lot. I'm so excited if we just do this. I cannot wait to see what God does. But I'm not a fool to think that it's as simple as hearing a message that's gonna break off that spirit of fear, a spirit of fear that may have plagued you from the time that you were born, or maybe it runs in your generational line, a spirit of fear. It's a spirit straight from the pit of hell. And so if you know there's a stronghold attached to that fear that you carry on the inside of you, and you find yourself, no matter how much you know about the Word of God, you still find yourself here time and time again, please do not leave here without allowing us to pray with you, to come into agreement, to break off that spirit of fear so you can fully run ahead in faith with Jesus Christ. Wow, what an amazing Word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.